and Bill. To look at what is happening in your area. And still to come here at 4 o'clock, President Biden saying today he's willing to go to greater lengths to strengthen abortion rights in the United States. The latest on his ongoing story right ahead. Only one station offers over six hours of news daily. Get your news when you want it with Dakota News Now. It's our free, free freedom sale at Mattress Room to celebrate the 4th of July. Get a free adjustable base, free pillows, and a free mattress protector on select Beautyrest mattresses. Cool down by saving up to $500 on Tempur-Pedic Breeze mattresses. Get a king mattress. July sale. Score outdoor upgrades up to 40% off. Mattresses and more up to 50%. Scientifically designed to help manage your blood. In his autobiography, it was the, the moment that there was um, this piece of music by Edward Elgar that played, and he wrote about how it undid him, and he made exactly... Oh, when Brad and I were talking, uh, you know, I think one of the most valuable things anyone can have, but particularly someone in public life, is having people whose love and respect they are so confident of that they will listen to any criticism from that person. In the past for her protection, Mayor Eric Adams rushing to the scene last night and making guns the focus earlier today. He announced the nation's first DNA gun crimes unit. Watch here. Uh, we know that there are too many guns on our streets. We're seeing the sickening reality of the overproliferation of guns and the obsession of using guns in our country. And as mayor and as a former police officer, I am dedicated uh, to stopping this madness. Greg, this is horrific. Once again, we have to talk about something that could have been prevented. Well, you know, the thing is, he shows up at every uh, tragedy, every murder scene, and I get it. That's what you're supposed to do. And then he tells you that it's bad, right? And that it's always this problem. But it it says this to you, it says you that police usually do show up after the crime is already committed which is why you sh when you catch a criminal you should be keeping them behind bars that's our first mistake and the second point you need prevention and what's prevention you need cops on the beat we i don't i mean i remember living in this city and seeing police on almost every street you don't see yeah, that don't anymore it, i feel like you see more homeless, drug-addicted zombies than cops by a long shot. And third and finally, you've got you to listen to the people when they say they're threatened. They knew who this guy was. She had been abused by this guy. And yet, the system screwed her. She's dead. The baby's got no mother, no father. Uh, judge, the suspect was just uh, identified, and it was given to Fox News. Um, but he's not been arrested yet. Well, what's interesting about this, and besides the, the tragedy and the horror of it all, um, uh, you've got a three-month-old baby who was, you know, in a stroller on a summer night uh, in what was once the safest big city in the United States. Uh, the, the mother is just shot dead, execution style. It's a domestic violence homicide. It has all the earmarks of it. The mother had been beaten when she was pregnant and six months pregnant. Okay, and domestic violence increases in intensity and frequency as time goes on. So anyone who knows that woman knows that if he's going to beat her six months pregnant, he's going to really take care of her when she's not pregnant. She called the police. She went to court. She was in a shelter for battered women. She did everything she was supposed to do, and the system failed her. The police failed her. Now, I don't know if she ever got to court, if she ever got an order of protection, if he was ever charged with a crime. I don't know. But what I do know right now is that in New York City, it is open season. And we've got a mayor who, as Greg rightly says, shows up after the crime. And you know what? I don't see the mayor as a cop. I see him as an ideologue because he says, he says there are more guns in our cities, it means more lives lost. First of all, he's wrong about that. There are studies that say that states with higher gun ownerships have fewer gun murders. We've also got the Crime Prevention Research Center shows that concealed handgun permit holders are extremely law-abiding. That's number one. Number two, can we hear from the Governor Hochul? Sure. I want to address Let's that one. Let's play that, please. 
Do you have the numbers to show that it's the concealed carry permit holders that are committing crimes? I don't need to have numbers. I don't need, I don't have to have a data point to point to to say that this is going to matter. All I know is I have a responsibility to the people of this state to have sensible gun safety laws. You have a responsibility to people of New York State. Your responsibility then is to go after Carl Heasty and Andrea Stewart Cousins and sign a law that puts these criminals in jail when they commit a crime. Stop with the ideological nonsense. The truth is, when she says, I don't need numbers, she doesn't know the reality. It is law-abiding citizens with guns who are going to protect themselves and not cops because you tied their hands behind their backs. Jessica, this is causing a lot of people to decide to leave liberal cities, not just New York, but certainly we've seen that the statistics of people leaving New York is stark. And it wasn't just COVID. No, there was uh, that data that came out just this week about it. Um, a big, I think it was in Axios, the report about it. Uh, this is something that I think started made for a lot of people because of COVID restrictions and now is continuing or for people who stuck it out and are looking around and saying, oh, my rent just got hiked 25 to 35%. Um, it doesn't feel safe here. I don't know if it's necessarily the best educational system for my kids. That's a big point um, that people are making who are considering, you know, whether they want to do charter schools or pods or whatever it might be. Um, I grew up here. I, I went to high school on 89th and Park Avenue. Mm -hmm. That's six blocks away from where this happened. Um, it's, it's truly frightening. Um, it's not just happening here, it's, it's happening all over the country. We had the woman who was pushing her baby and the guy drove into them and yes. she managed to, yes. I don't know how she pulled that off. That was, um, Los Angeles. That was incredible in LA. Um, we need real policy positions that can become actionable. There are a lot of ideas percolating around. Mayor Adams has put things out there. We need to see how they work. In terms of the concealed carry permits, I agree with Governor Hochul insofar as that New Yorkers and in New York City, for instance, there's just a discomfort with there being a lot of guns around. And she will continue to make That's good. people... Yeah. No, it's, it, it's not good. I, I don't want to feel uncomffortable, but certainly saying I that, don't that need a number, matter. you do need... You Doesn't do need matter the numbers, and we know that the people who are committing these crimes are criminals. She they're should not have had a concealed carry permit. If someone is going to burglarize a house, they're not going to a house where there's a gun. So if they know there's a gun there, they're not That's going in. Jesse Waters, you're you'll not learn being to be forgotten. comfortable. <laughs> we get the post delivered to the apartment every day, and you, this is on the front page. And I'm picking up, and I open it up, and Emma sees it across the breakfast table, and she goes, "What does that say?" And she looks at where this happened. This is a 20 minute walk from our apartment yeah. and she goes, Jesse, I wanna move. Yep. And that's just her speaking from the heart because this was, I think last month, three blocks from my apartment, they had the guy in all black chasing the guy on the street, stabbing him. So a, a couple more of these and I'm moving to Westchester, upstate, New Jersey, God help me. And and cuz <laughs> between COVID and crime, people do not wanna live in the city anymore. And forget, if I'm wrong, correct me. If this guy's beating his wife or his girlfriend, and if he has a handgun, shouldn't that be red flagged away? I mean, right? We don't have we red don't flag have. gloves. Yeah. In New York, in New York, we mm -hmm. don't have a red flag. I thought we no. had a red flag in New York. I guarantee you that gun is not legal. Okay, but either way, if it was legal, it should have been taken from him. I don't like how Adams talks. Oh, Why are you reading? Okay. Why are you reading from notes? He right. should be speaking Why from the heart. Right. He sounds like Pierre, the woman at the White House press secretary. You should be out there pouring your heart out to people instead of looking down and saying how much you care and how bad guns are. I don't trust this guy. Up next. Campaign Committee and a member of the House Intelligence Committee. It is very nice to see you again, sir. I, I, I want to ask you how you take not just 63% public opinion that was for leaving Roe versus Wade in place, but what's happening now are these bans that leave out exceptions for life of a mother. 93% of Americans oppose those. Taking out the exceptions for cases of rape and incest, 83 to 87% of Americans oppose that. How do you take the extreme nature of what Republicans are actually doing now and turn that into an electoral issue? Well, look, we're seeing dramatic uh we're seeing dramatic movement in the polls in key races. We're seeing people in the street. I was at rallies in uh, Rockland County, New York, and in New York City over the last weekend. People are fired up. But we also have short-term actions we must take to protect Roe now. I mean, there's a set of substantive actions that we need to take, and they are executive actions, legislative actions, 
but there are also private sector actions. And we need to do all those things to make sure women are kept safe and that they can continue to make their own reproductive decisions. And everything needs to be on the table. But there are also procedural ways that we can, we can make democracy work better. And that's where the filibuster comes in. And then there's an electoral uh, uh, action we must take. Right now, if you go to DCCC.org slash Defend Choice, just go to DCCC.org, you can get involved in the midterms. We're going to put you to work. And that ultimately, holding the House, getting two more votes in the Senate, is what's going to get Roe v. Wade back into federal law and guarantee reproductive freedom once again in this country. How do you take, though, the emotional appeal that Republicans have successfully used for 40 years and match that? I mean, what you gave was the tactical and the procedural and the process for how you do it. But how do you make it land in the gut of the 93% of Americans who oppose what Republicans are doing? And that's these complete bans. Well, look, the, the best message is always impact. And I think um, right now there are millions of Americans who understand we're going the wrong way that we are going back on 50 years of guaranteed reproductive freedom. Um, talk to people out in the street, they get it. It makes them angry that their, their daughters, my daughters, are gonna have fewer rights than, than the generation that came before them. Uh, going back 50 years, I talked to someone who's an immigrant to this country, he said, I came to America to escape governments that have policies like this. Uh, people understand emotionally what it means to have the Supreme Court rip away constitutionally protected rights. And they're not finished. And anybody who cares about marriage equality, anybody who, who cares about making intimate decisions on their own, um, interracial marriage even, all of these things depend on an understanding of the Constitution that this court has now rejected. Let's be really clear. If the Republicans take control of the Congress with one law, they can ban abortion in all 50 states. And the choice is going to be, do you want a party that's going to criminalize abortion and ban it in all 50 states, or do you want a party that's going to keep Roe v. Wade protecting your freedoms? That's the choice. Congressman, I want to ask you, because we had so many conversations. Uh... Dakota, further north and west, they are clearing out. Temperatures are in the low 80s, further northwest, even some upper 70s as well. But most of the region in the mid to upper 80s and even a few low 90s, like in Yankton, 93 degrees. Wind is coming in from the northwest. It's averaging between 15 and 20 miles an hour. A little bit of an improvement from where we were at yesterday. The rest of the night, temperatures do stay relatively comfortable. We'll fall back to the low 60s for tomorrow morning. And the next big thing will show that there will be some showers and thunderstorms trying to move into southwestern South Dakota tomorrow morning. Those won't be severe. Most of the day Friday actually will be staying dry. But then by Friday night, another thunderstorm complex builds into the southwestern part of the state. That could become severe, so we're going to be monitoring that. Just the beginning of multiple rounds of thunderstorms that we are tracking throughout the holiday weekend. We'll time those out coming up in just a few minutes, Sam. Tyler, thank you. And just a little south of Sioux Falls, there is a growing music and entertainment scene in Canton. Daniel Heineman from the Canton Performing Arts Council is joining us to talk about some events that are coming up this summer. And before we get too in depth into those events, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the organization's overall role? It's relatively new. And what is you all's mission? Well, our, our Performing Arts Council is dedicated to bringing uh, a variety of a entertainment acts to our brand new Performing Arts Center, which opened about four years ago attached to our, our high school. It seats about a thousand people. It's state of the art, um, and it's, uh, one of few, uh, it, it's one of the few built for a high school in the area, and so we wanted to showcase that facility uh, to the area. And there is a great tribute coming up, a tribute to Johnny Cash. What are some of your thoughts on that live performance and what people can expect for that? This, James Garner, who is going to be performing a Johnny Cash tribute, uh, is known as one of the best Johnny Cash uh, aficionados, if you will, or tribute uh, musicians in the country. He's coming from California. He's going to be in the Performing Arts Center on the 15th. At, uh, at doors open at 5.30. The concert starts at 6.30 with a local uh, musician by the name of Chris Sandvig, who's going to open for Mr. Garner and his tribute band, who will go on probably a little after 7 o'clock. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, what I've seen and after I've talked to him, uh, he really, really loves Johnny Cash and does a wonderful job. He even 
looks like a young Johnny Cash. So I think it'll be a fun evening, and Ken's only 15 miles from the southern border of Sioux Falls, so we think it'll be a great opportunity to have some fun and enjoy some really good music. Not too far at all, and a dangerous combination to look and sound like uh, Johnny Cash. Is there anything else that you have on your radar uh, in the future for this summer that you're also looking forward to? Not this summer, but this fall and winter and into the spring. We have are uh, about to announce in August, we'll announce our, our lineup for our, our performing arts series uh, for the 2022-23 season. And we're always looking for good entertainment to bring to the area in a thousand seat format. And uh, we think we have a venue that people will really enjoy listening to and watching and performing in. Seems like it seems like you can seldom go wrong uh, with good music anyway. So we appreciate you joining us and, fun. and taking some time to speak with us. James Gardner's tribute to Johnny Cash. That is July 15th. That will begin at 630 in the evening at the Performing Arts Center. Tickets for the live concert are on sale right now. We're back in the check the forecast when we come back. Credits opposing the gas tax holiday in 2007, yeah, yeah, 2008. With the, he says, and because McCain and Hillary Clinton were in favor of it in 2008, yes. and, and his opposition he thinks is the reason that he beat her in North Carolina and, and tied with her in Indiana and became the Democratic nominee. Yeah, and you know he did on his own. He there wasn't a big consultation. He got asked about it, and he said, "Hey, we tried that in the legislature in 2000, and none of the money got to consumers." It was kind of a gimmick, a fig leaf for politicians. And what we really need to do is change our en our energy mix. And he got a lot of credit from voters for telling the truth about that. And a lot of people in Washington thought it was crazy to do it, but I think it did it did contribute to his victory in 2008. Now, gas is, gas prices then were at the quaint low price of four dollars, Jake, not five. So, but I, I suspect there's a, a fair amount of skepticism about it today as well. Earlier, we referred to a new poll showing that 85% of the American people think the United States is heading in the wrong direction. That, frankly, points to disaster for Democrats in November. Yeah. Look, uh, there are a lot of, you know, if you were looking at the chart, you'd say the vitals are not good. The president's approval ratings at 38%. The, his economic ratings are low. Consumer confidence is down. The number that you uh, mentioned. The one thing that I don't know is how this uh, <clears throat> ruling by the Supreme Court last week is going to affect things. I've heard from people all over the country who've been doing focus groups and polling this week, and it really does seem to have galvanized people, and not just about this issue, but concerns about Republicans uh, and extremism. And, uh, you know, if I were a Republican strategist, I'd be a little bit worried about that right now. Uh, I, I don't think we fully understand what the political impact is going to be uh, but that is one countervailing fact. But on the basic numbers, you're absolutely right, and I think everybody recognizes that this, uh, at current course and speed, this could be a very painful fall for Democrats. Yeah, I remember 2010, just watching the red <laughs> wave, the red wave, cover, you know, go all the way, just wiping out all your Democratic House allies as it that that election night. David yeah, Axelrod, I, I still have still have the bruises, my friend. <laughs> Good to see you. Thanks so much, David Axelrod. Good to see you. A, a crime that pushed the fight for civil rights into the national spotlight. Now a discovery decades later could finally lead to some modicum of justice over the lynching of Emmett Till. Stay with us. To pivot work by vacation high. Could come out. Uh, that we haven't learned about so far. What kind of evidence? What else is there that we don't know about? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the Petito attorney this morning told me uh, that they will try to get text messages and emails. Lot, um, and to three more lots to uh, offset maintenance and tax burden on their lot, and then a request in 2015 that I've worked so hard for. Rosalind's and Dave feeds it. Just then, our hero has a breakthrough. Shoot it, camera. But Cheryl denies the accusation. She insists that the only and, uh, sister, my daughter's name is Valerie Biden. If you call her Valeria Biden one more time, 
I'm going to come back and knock your bonnet off. <laughs> Do I make myself clear? <laughs> so there's a time to be kind and there's a time to take a stand. Right. Um, it's the difference that we all have trouble figuring out sometimes, which is which. And therein history is made in that decision. Yeah. Uh, he had a similar incident with Joe uh, when he was in seventh or eighth grade, but that's another story. That's about the stutter, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you want, I mean, yes, the nun made fun of him. Mr. Biden? How, who in the class can tell Biden how to pronounce that word? And the word was gentleman. And Joe, when stutterers speak, they speak in a cadence, in a rhythm. And Joe said, Sir Walter Raleigh was a gentle man. And uh, he, she made fun of him. He, he got up and he left. He walked out of school. Again, that's a profile of courage to do. <clears throat> so not, and he walked the three or four miles home, told mommy wasn't going back, and she threw him in the car, too, went back to the nun. And uh, it was a repeat performance. And I think my mother may have added a few expletives in on this one. <laughs> I hope so. I hope Excuse so. me, I'm sorry, Mike. You, you, you're you, recuperating. Uh, Brad? All backed by a lifetime guarantee. And it's showing all the hallmarks of grinding on for a very long time, becoming this war of attrition, possibly a forever war. Because, I mean, we've seen the U.S. intelligence talking about uh, Russia probably wanting to take this entire country, despite morale being low uh, amongst Russian troops, despite not making the gains they need to make. Uh, Putin's objective still seems to be to take all of Ukraine. And most Ukrainians you speak to are fully aware of that. They they realize that he's not going to be satisfied with the East, with Crimea, with taking Mariupol. Uh, he wants this entire country, and it's a frightening prospect for them because they can't get on with their lives. You can't plan for the future when you're being uh, viciously attacked by your neighbor. I mean, uh, look, their, their um, candidacy status for the EU got rushed through. But at the end of the day, they know they're not going to become an EU membership, even if they go through all the procedures and pass it properly until this war is over. People come and go from the country thinking, OK, it might be safe to come back and start your business. And then Kiev gets hit and they have to leave again. So it's a very, very debilitating cycle for everybody in this country to live through. And, you know, if you watch the Richard Engels interview with Zelensky, he also worries uh, that uh, the that the, the West is going to become very tired of this war with Ukraine because it's costing them a lot of money. The, war, the longer this war goes on, uh, the more it drives uh, down profits in, in the West when you factor in refugees, mm -hmm. energy, uh, rearmament. These are all huge costs for the West. And if this is going to be a war of attrition, uh, Ukrainians are asking themselves, how much longer are we going to get supported? Yeah, and I mean, I, I think, Cal, the only thing more bleak than that assessment is the alternative. I mean, w w what do you think the ability for, for, for people to really contemplate the, the, the grim and really dangerous implications of the alternative? For, for the, you know, and I keep going back to the briefings that we all got um, at the beginning from the administration that this was going to be quick, that Russia would take over, they would have control of Kyiv in a matter of days, not weeks. The Ukrainians were the plot twist that nobody saw coming, that Western intelligence missed. What, is, what sort of recalibrations have we made to make sure to help guarantee their success? So I think one of the issues is just because the Ukrainians had that initial success of stopping the Russians, it doesn't mean they're winning this war, right? The Ukrainians yeah. are very much losing this war. Thousands of Ukrainians are dying. We don't know how many civilians are dying. We don't know how many soldiers are dying on the front because it's a country at war and they're not going to share that information for very legitimate security uh, purposes. I hate uh, the winners and losers talk in war because it's war and it's terrible and there are no winners and losers. But uh, if anyone's winning this war, the United States is 
who's winning this war because their goals of strengthening NATO, of strengthening a European alliance, of weakening the Russian military, of costing the Russian military lives, lives of young men and women who don't know what they're doing there, um, they're succeeding in doing so. We should also mention big losers in this war are the millions of people who are going to starve to death in coming years. 18 million people in the Horn of Africa are now in a food emergency because of the war uh, in Ukraine. The United States, for my entire lifetime, was always seen as playing a peacemaker role in every conflict. And for all of the obvious and right reasons, the U.S. cannot play that role here. But it does not take away from the fact of what you're laying out, which is the cost of this war in lives is something I don't think we have really a good grasp of, and we certainly don't know how it ends. Bringing to light evidence favoring Glossop's innocence. They can say, ignore this thing and let's set an execution date for this man, or they can say, you know, boy, there's, there's something here. The more than 300-page report done by international law firm Reed Smith points to an inadequate police investigation and states, quote, our conclusion is that no reasonable juror hearing the complete record would have convicted Richard Glossop of first-degree murder. The report found prosecutors intentionally destroyed evidence and uncovered evidence that never went before a jury, calling it, quote, a complete breakdown in our criminal justice system. The original lead prosecutor did not respond to CNN's request for comment. Investigators say the attorney general's office did not respond to requests for access to records and evidence. They talked to people who have never been talked to before. They found paperwork that had never been found before. The report was commissioned by a bipartisan group of 34 state lawmakers, including 28 Republicans, led by McDougal. If we put an innocent man to death, that means we can do it again in the future. And so why have the death penalty? Oklahoma is second in the country behind Texas for carrying out the most executions. Since his involvement with the Glossop case, McDougal has filed three bills in the state house to reform capital punishment. None have moved forward. But there's hope Glossop's case and the report will create change. When you're a Republican standing up for somebody that, that needs to be uh, exonerated, uh, it's difficult because some may call you soft on crime. Uh, you may lose your next election based off of it, uh, but to me, I always go back to this is, this is a man's life. And the AG's office isn't commenting about this report to us, and we didn't get a call back from the current district attorney's office. But listen, I talked to Knight earlier today, right after he actually was visiting Glossop in prison. He said Glossop got that report this past Tuesday. He read it over, and he said, quite frankly, his reaction, he's angry, Jake, and he's scared. There's a lot in those 350 pages that he never even knew about, and he's worried, really, no one's going to pay attention now. Of course, we've seen so much support here, but the next steps, Knight is going to file this paperwork tomorrow, and the media the goal is to really just stop the state from setting a new execution date and then ultimately, of course, exonerate Glossop. We'll stay on top of this, Jake. All right, Bryn Gingrass, great reporting. Thank you so much. It has been nearly 70 years since Emmett Till's murder spurred much of the civil rights movement. Why his family says now they're finally hopeful that some justice may be served. Stay with us. What if I sleep hot? Installation and... That risk their lives by providing them with more one way to sell your house. I've used Ideal Agent 12 years of my life. Oh. Wasn't it? It was promise me, Dad, that you won't disengage. Promise me, Dad, you'll stay in. We got that right. And it reads for you. You can so you can do more incredible things working, or just living independently in daily life, no matter your age. This is an important message for every... Today, Dugan Sales and Service is the oldest family-owned appliance center.
this is Mike and Sarah from Schulte Subaru. We've previously talked about how very happy with it. Even my you can get the Granite Stone Blue 12 piece set, not for this is an important message for every traffic leading police to issue a dispersal order. Officers donned riot gear, even deployed smoke before the group cleared out. Police Chief John Toom said the city is not threat treating the incident as a riot, but rather as an unlawful assembly since they didn't get a permit ahead of time. A different protest in Sioux Falls today, this one urging Sanford Health to stop using animals for medical training, it was organized by the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Sanford's Advanced Trauma Life Support course, which is taught at the Sanford Medical Center in Fargo, involves cutting into pigs to teach invasive procedures. Protest organizers say of the 385 programs of this type in the U.S. and Canada, this is the only one still using animals. Sanford say, says that the training follows the guidelines of the Animal Welfare Act. A groundbreaking today on the Veterans Community Project. It's a housing community near Burnside Park that will be made up of 25 homes. It's an innovative approach. They'll all be in tiny houses between 240 and 320 square feet, allowing for more affordable, efficient housing. They'll house veterans free of charge as part of an effort to combat homelessness. We are still combating with the heat. It's not as bad today, but the uh, humidity definitely up a little bit in some areas. Yeah, that it is, Sam. And you know, tonight we will stay quiet overall. There will be a few showers and thunderstorms in southwestern South Dakota tomorrow morning. Most of the day Friday will be quiet, but then another round of showers and thunderstorms will be building in for Friday night going into Saturday morning. And that will be kind of the theme as we head into the holiday weekend itself. Chances for showers and thunderstorms persisting not only over the weekend itself, but also into the beginning of next week as well, which would of course include the fourth. Some fireworks in the sky possibly, but oh, yeah. not the ones coming from here from down there. I right. guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Tyler, appreciate your time. Jeopardy's up next. Have a good day. communicate with them at home. Only 10% of hearing. New everyone. To sh that education help. Um, Emily, do you want to tell us about more? Uh, weird. All right. I wonder how turn. many times. Well, if, if you would all join. Take an hour, sit down. It's July 3rd at 7 p.m. It's called Ukraine Answering the Call. It airs on NBC at 7 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. We'll see you there. Quick break for us. We'll be right back. Did you know that most cars today have a cabin air filter? Uh, so there you go. And that's her neighbor. Look at that made a jam. Aww. That's very Talk cute. about like getting off scot-free and have to pay for that. Exactly. Um, <laughs> happy birthday, Mom. <laughs> happy birthday. Jesse. Jesse's got some jewelry anywhere in their system. Let's bring in CNN's Ryan Young now. Ryan, how was this arrest warrant discovered and what's the reaction from Emma Till's family? Well, as you can imagine, Jake, this has been fascinating in terms of the details of this story, but for this family, they've never given up hope. They've never stopped fighting over 70 years. It was actually their own family foundation that was in that basement and they said they found a dusty, dank box that they opened up and there was the warrant. It was signed, it was ready to go. Three names appeared on it. And of course, now they want that warrant served. And you talked about the fact that she recanted that admission several years later. But think about the two men who were involved in this case, who were tried and also found not guilty. They told a magazine years later that they actually did the crime. And if it wasn't for Jet Magazine putting out those photos years ago of Emmett Till's face, badly beaten, tortured before he was murdered, a 14-year-old, the whole country sort of changed when you think about the civil rights movement and how people started stepping into the streets because they thought this was a line that should have been never crossed. And then put the fact that now, 70 years later, this family is still fighting for justice. They want to see something happen. They want to see the warrant serve. But as we've been talking to law experts throughout the day, they feel there should be some hurdles that could come along with that because obviously the woman now lives in North Carolina, not in Mississippi. So this conversation is not over, Jake. But if you think about it, this family has not given up. So much time has passed, but those images seared into the brains of a lot of Americans. Jake? Can Donham be arrested? Yeah, and that is the big question. I actually talked to a lawyer just before coming on set.
He says, look, the warrant still may be good in Mississippi, but because she lives in North Carolina and she was never served it or never ran from it, there might be some uh, talk about whether or not she could be moved from one state to the next. So this all will have to get played out in the legal eyes, but so far most lawyers believe that there will be some more hurdles when it comes to whether or not they can move her or not, especially at this point. All right, Ryan Young, thanks so much. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the TikTok at Jake Tapper. You can tweet the show at the lead CNN. We actually read them. If you ever miss an episode of the show, you know what you can do? You can listen to the lead wherever you get your podcasts. Our coverage now continues with one Mr. Wolf Blitzer right next door in a place I like to call the Situation Room. Happening now, new information about potential witness intimidation in the January 6th investigation. Sources tell CNN that a Trump ally tried to influence Cassidy Hutchinson's explosive testimony. This, as the panel is awaiting a response to its subpoena of Trump's former White House counsel, Pat Cipollone. Also tonight, President Biden says he now supports dropping Senate filibuster rules to clear the way for passage of an abortion rights law. He's facing growing political pressure over the end of Roe versus Wade. And at a pivotal moment for the divided U.S. Supreme Court, Ketanji Brown Jackson just became the first black woman sworn in as a Supreme Court justice. We want to welcome our viewers here in the United States and around the world. I'm Wolf Blitzer. You're in the Situation Room. We begin with new evidence that at least one Trump ally attempted to influence the January 6th committee star witness, fearing what Cassidy Hutchinson would reveal to the panel and to the nation. CNN congressional correspondent Ryan Nobles is working the story. New information tonight about the January 6th committee's star witness, Cassidy Hutchinson. Sources tell CNN that Hutchinson was one of two examples that Vice Chair Liz Cheney used to show Trump allies were putting pressure on former staff members to stay loyal to the former president. Our committee commonly asks witnesses connected to Mr. Trump's administration or campaign whether they've been contacted by any of their former colleagues or anyone else who attempted to influence or impact their testimony. Witness intimidation among a growing list of potential crimes the committee believes Trump and his top advisors could be at the center of. It's a very serious issue, and I would imagine the Department of Justice uh, would be very interested in and would take that very seriously as well. But Trump and his allies are pushing back, attacking Hutchinson and questioning her credibility, all because of a dispute over one aspect of her testimony. The Secret Service arguing the details she recounted being told about Trump lunging at his detail inside a presidential suburban are not accurate. The former president clearly backing the Secret Service members who were part of the story, Tony Ornato and Bobby Engel. These are great people. They've devoted their lives to it. And I think they were very embarrassed by it because it yeah. makes them sound terrible. But members of the committee saying that Ornato's story doesn't add up and they need to make it clear what he knows under oath. Mr. Ornato did not have as clear of memories uh, from uh, this period of time as I would say Ms. Hutchinson did. Congressman Adam Kinzinger taking it a step further, saying in a tweet, quote, there seems to be a major thread here. Tony Ornato likes to lie. Meanwhile, the committee issuing a subpoena to former White House counsel Pat Cipollone, a key figure members believe has a lot to share. There are quite a few things that he could tell the committee that would not be subject to privilege. And I think it's important. Cipollone already signaling that he may be willing to sit for a transcribed deposition. As for others who are fighting subpoenas, frustration is mounting from the lack of action from the Department of Justice. Mark Meadows and Dan Scavino have refused to come in and talk to Congress. We have the power of subpoena similar to what a court has, and the Justice Department has failed to indict them for that. And so all it does is send a message, you just have to resist the select committee, and you may be able to resist all penalties. That's been a frustration. And Wednesday night at the Reagan Library in California, Cheney using the work of the committee to make a case that it's time for the party to move past Trump. To the little girls and to the young women who are watching tonight, these days, for the most part, men are running the world, and it is really not going that well. 
And the committee continuing their work today spotted at the location where they hold their depositions, Eugene Scalia, the former labor secretary during the Trump administration. Scalia reportedly part of that group of cabinet secretaries that discussed invoking the 25th Amendment in the days after January 6th. His testimony, a crucial part of this investigation by the January 6th Select Committee. Wolf. Ryan Nobles reporting from Capitol Hill. Thank you very much. Uh, we're joined now by CNN chief political correspondent Dana Bash, CNN legal analyst Elliot Wilson showers in western into central portions of South Dakota. Scattered thunderstorms possible this weekend, but temperatures will be at or above average for early July. A very complete forecast for that in just a few minutes. Thanks, Jay. Two Pennington County deputies are being honored today for their courageous work in the field. Kelderland City Thorson shares their stories in tonight's Positively Kelderland. While on duty a year ago, Pennington County Deputy Anthony White responded to a call of a man who had been stabbed. I looked down and I realized the seriousness of his wounds and I actually said out loud, this isn't good. White reacted quickly, applying pressure to the man's injuries and keeping him conscious until an ambulance arrived. That's why today he's receiving the Meritorious Service Award. The people of this community is very important to us and uh, Deputy White just given the award just represents the epitome of that. He's one of the guys that jumps on it first thing. Hey, I want to come in or I want to come in and work that call or he responds to him automatically. It just goes to show that my agency doesn't necessarily forget about its employees and the, and the work that we try to do every day. Deputy Chris Lindquist was awarded the Medal of Distinguished Service because he saved a man's life while putting his own life at risk during a fire last week in Wall. Definitely is a very dangerous situation. Uh, the smoke was very overpowering. It was very thick. It was getting your eyes, your nose, your lungs, and it was hard to hard to breathe. Even though there was a lot of carnage and wreckage, I believe that it was the best outcome that could happen at the time. Deputy White says while being recognized is not always in the job description, it never changes the pride he feels working in law enforcement. Once I started this, I realized that this is home. With Positively Kelloland, I'm Sydney Thorson. The Pennington County Sheriff's Office is looking to hire more deputies like White and Lindquist. We've included a link to its website under this story on Kelloland.com. Still to come, uh, Parkston is hosting a big 4th of July celebration that covers several days. We'll take you to the celebration of freedom, featuring everything from a caravan of motorcycles to a traveling Vietnam wall. Just ahead. We've had a north breeze during the day today, but still it's been pretty warm. Sioux Falls a couple of hours ago, our high tip was 92. It made the mid-80s across most of eastern Kelland. Lots of warm days in your forecast for the upcoming weekend. That forecast is next. We're filling you in on the as May, and that the administration has discretion of whether or not to return somebody to Mexico. So the Biden administration wanted to exercise that discretion and stop returning people to Mexico. They were allowed under the law. And let's talk about the other significant decision. It's just how the EPA is allowed to enforce restrictions on how to protect the environment. And the court reducing the EPA's power here. This is a huge win for the coal industry, not so much for the Biden administration. Explain this case and what this case means. So, um, this case was basically an argument between how much authority do our regulatory agencies have. Now, the Congress had passed the Clean Air Act in the 1970s, authorizing the EPA to enact regulations around pollution. But Chief Justice Roberts for the court said this particular act against the power plant was a step too far. It was, they named this major doctrine that said that if they were passing something regarding significant and had a significant economic effect, then Congress had to be more explicit. And he said Congress wasn't explicit enough in terms of this particular act around the power plants. And so how does this decision affect other government agencies? Well, this then now will bring all of the government agencies' actions more into scrutiny because, you know, Congress passes laws, but the details of how things are run are basically through all the ver various federal regulations, the day-to-day -day how to adapt and change regulations based on what's happening now. So they're saying they're kind of asking them now to pull back and say, you know, if there is some significant economic effect from your regulation, Congress has to be very explicit. So I think we're going to see a lot more lawsuits from businesses any time that regulations, new regulations trying to uh, deal with an issue come into effect. We will see a lot more pushback.
from the businesses about that. All right, Dina, thank you so much for being here and breaking it down for us. Thanks for having me. After 43 days on the run, the suspect in a deadly love triangle is now in custody. But we now have again the, the calls for packing the court, for making it over, for doing away with it. Uh, what do you think of what we're hearing on Capitol Hill? Well, I think it's all based on a lie, Shannon, because what they say again and again is that the court is usurping power when what's clear from this term is what it's doing is restoring constitutional order. So as John just pointed out, they're giving the power to Congress that Congress rightly has under the Constitution. Uh, in connection with the uh, case, the other case that you mentioned, the, the Remain in Mexico case, uh, they basically made clear that this is a situation where you have the executive branch, if to implement this policy, has to be able to negotiate with foreign governments. So there's an interplay between the executive and congressional statutes. In the abortion case, they didn't, uh, they didn't take power to the court what they did was return it to the states. The complaint that we've had for half a century is that the states were, were governing this and were regulating abortion uh, up until 1973 when the court took the issue away from them. All the court has done here is shed power from itself and give it back to the states. So I think what, what's happening here is this is a court that is restoring order in the sense of the, the responsibility is being assigned in the places where it was supposed to be assigned as the Constitution and the law were understood at the time they were, whichever laws or the provisions of the Constitution were adopted. It's been a wild term and we're still waiting for word on the leaker as well. Andy and Jonathan, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Stocks were off. The Dow lost 254. The S&P 500 dropped 33. Nasdaq fell 149. Well, President Biden has just arrived back at the White House following his trip to Europe to meet with leaders there about the economy, energy, and NATO's response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The president says the U.S. will bolster its military presence in Europe and that Vladimir Putin will feel what the president calls the NATOization of Europe. White House correspondent Jackie Heinrich reports tonight from Madrid, Spain. Good evening, Jackie. Good evening, Shannon. Father, if you will, of the uh, of, of the event there. Let me throw this out, though. It, it, I think probably the most serious thing that I've heard about a prosecution, and, I, and I, I would agree that this may be a real threat to them, and that is this idea of witness tampering. Um, if, if they can link the witness tampering that we heard about in the committee hearing back to Trump or at, at Trump's direction, then I think that's a much more uh, likely scenario that you may see a prosecution on. It removes the political obstacles. It removes the issues that you'd have to deal with because he was a candidate at the time. And, and even when we talk about just the facts of the case that came out, this idea that he was directing people to come through the magnetometers, if you just change the inflection of his statement that's attributed to him, and that is, you know, they're not here to hurt me versus you're not here to hurt me. It, it changes the entire context of the discussion. And so those things would have to be overcome. You don't have those same hurdles to jump over. If you just talk no, about Michael, the fact that Michael, I'll jump in. He's directed I'll, to, jump, yeah. I'll jump in to, to, to litigate this a little, and, and then when we're done lawyering, yeah. Howard can, can just come in and talk like a normal person. Uh, I don't think you go through an armed insurrection and the only capital attack in the United States in the last century to do tampering. I mean... It's important, and people go to jail for it, uh, but this ain't a tampering case. Uh, if, well, if prosecutors I, see that, and wait, I'm going to finish, and then you'll finish, okay? If prosecutors want to deal with that, um, they can do so. It's not nothing, and we've seen federal mafia cases and others deal with it. But we are talking about an armed attack on the seat of government with multiple people in Trump's orbit saying, admitting in public their goal was to overthrow the election. They're claiming the fifth over the, that pursuant activity. And he issued what, what one expert on this program called an illegal order. I get you on the inflection. And yes, everyone gets their day in court to explain what they meant, what they said. But he uh, also asked them to let in the armed people. And I don't care whether you're the president no. of the United States or a random agent. You do not let armed people in. The magnetometers are there for a reason, and that alone would seem to be an illicit order. Uh, so with all that on the table, I let you respond. Yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't put much stock into this whole idea about coming in under the magnetometers. This guy's such a narcissist, he's worried about his crowd size at every event. 
and, and, and the magnet toppers <laughs> weren't an issue at the Capitol. They were an issue down at the uh, uh, at the ellipse there. So this this is not a this is not a situation where he was lining people up on the Capitol steps. I'm all for prosecuting who deserves to be prosecuted, but you better have something more than some speculation and possibility and a little hearsay here, a little hearsay there. You better have some text, some messages, some witnesses who will come and say he did this, he said that. And, and that's what makes a prosecution. We can all write good books about the, the history of this thing, and that's, and again, I'm not defending him. I'm not here as a defender because no, I think I know he was you're, a you're, you're here yeah, I, doing I, what we asked you to do, which is independent yeah. legal analysis. We're talking it out. Do you think Mr. Right. Eastman, uh, do you think Mr. Eastman uh, has criminal liability? He ser certainly seems to think he does. He, he may have some criminal liability, and that is we're going to see what's on his, his telephone. We'll know. Uh, did he make false documents? Did he make some statements? Are, are there things that they planned in court? Those those are very different things than talking about a sitting president of the United States at the, being charged for conduct while he was sitting president. I guess a former president being yep. charged while he was conduct. Let me bring in. Yep. Let president. me bring we, in Howard. Do we want that? You know, do we want that as a country? I think that's a, a question. Well, that's, that a, different that's a different question, sir. But that's a different question. I would I, I would, I would encourage you. Gonna, hold on. I would encourage you not to conflate the evidence with the prudential matter. Gosh, Howard, I feel like I'm really on a bad day in law school. But the prudential <laughs> matter is the ultimate question over whether, at a policy level, indicting certain individuals in a certain way under the structure of government is a good or bad idea. And you could take the position, take Nixon, let's take Trump out of it. You could take the position that indicting Nixon after he left office was not prudentially right. That's very different than saying, did Nixon commit crimes? The evidence shows he did. So. First you did the evidence, then you did the, the call. I'll come back to you after Howard, but uh, Howard, your thoughts on all of the above. Okay, so um, uh, since I'm not an attorney and I have no ability to argue with, with either one of you about any of this, let me tell you about the politics of it. <clears throat> Herschel Walker is now trailing Raphael Warnock in Georgia by mm, single digits, but it's getting bigger. Uh, right. Mike Lee is in trouble in Utah because there's a young... <laughs> Uh, uh, independent out there who's moderate and he was endorsed by the Democrats, but he's not a Democrat. Um, J.D. Vance is in trouble, is behind Tim Ryan in Ohio. So now this is not all, and this is in spite of the fact that they're t that the Democrats are running are 10 points ahead of Biden in terms of favorability. Usually what you see in the midterms is the president's unpopular and he drags the Congress down. Not happening. There's two explanations. Most people hmm. today believe the Supreme Court is a rogue organization. That's a fact. Their approval rating is down around 33 percent after these, and after today, it's going to be worse. And if they start screwing around with the elections, as they've said they were going to do next year, they're going to be in the same boat as Trump in terms of their respectability. So you've got that, and then you've got all this stuff about Trump and whether he's a crook. But it doesn't, I mean, it almost doesn't matter if he's a crook or not. I'm for the rule of law, and I think he should be treated like everybody, every other American citizen. And I'll leave all to you gentlemen to figure that all out. But what the American public is seeing every single day is this guy's a crook. Because when somebody gets Ooh. charged, the American people, contrary to the jury instructions, is believes they're guilty. I, it may not be right, but that's how the system is. Until you actually, you do better in a courtroom than you do in the court of public opinion in this country. Yeah. So I think... I, I look. I, I I think the guy is a crook. I grew up in New York. He's never done an honest thing in his life. People don't lend him money in New York because they know they'll never get paid back. All this stuff with Deutsche Bank. I mean, the guy is filth from beginning to end of his whole life. That's what's important. So all this stuff about the hearings, which is pretty bad, and having credible young women come and say, "Here's what really happened," and everybody he threw the plate against the wall and all this kind of stuff. That's what people are going to remember. And then Tish James has got another thing in New York, and who knows what's going to happen there. People, most, the reason Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff are in the Senate today is because of Donald Trump. Because during that runoff, there were a whole lot of moderate Republican, particularly women, white women in the suburbs who said, we do, this is not somebody, we, this is, we shouldn't be going on in this country. That's what's going to happen again in the midterms. I think we're going to pick up a lot of seats. I think we're. I, I do not think we're going to lose the house at this point, point. Um, and I, I, you know, you guys can mumbo jumbo about the legal stuff, and I'm not making fun of it. It's really critical stuff, but it's above the, my head, and it's above the head of most American people. This is well, a bad gonna, show for the president. I think you walked through a lot of the key elements, Howard. I have another question for you on that. If we're going to do mumbo jumbo, 
Uh, I get to be mumbo, Michael, you're jumbo. Okay. Russian forces have withdrawn from a strategic Black Sea island after relentless Ukrainian attacks. Russia is portraying the pullout from Snake Island off the port of the city of Odessa as a goodwill gesture. But Russian troops maintain their push to encircle the last stronghold of Ukrainian resistance in an eastern province. Let's bring in Fox News senior strategic analyst, retired General Jack Keane. General, always good to see you. Yeah, it's great to see you, Shannon. I'm going to start off with a little bit of what the president had to say uh, before leaving the NATO summit in Madrid. The reason why gas prices are up is because of Russia. Russia, Russia, Russia. The reason why the food crisis exists is because of Russia. Russia not allowing grain to get out of Ukraine. General, Russia is certainly a major foreign policy problem uh, around the world. But how fair do you think it is for the president to also assign blame for our domestic issues with what's going on with Russia? Well, certainly they're a contributing factor. But as, as our experts have said time and time again, all of that began before the Russian invasion in, in terms of gas prices uh, and inflation. I mean, it's, it's convenient to use this as sort of an excuse for likely other policy failures, but it, it's not the real issue here. Certainly what Russia is doing inside U, U, Ukraine uh, truly matters. And, uh, and, I, and I think where we are, frankly, Shannon, is we're at a tipping point here because Russia is, is economically devastating Ukraine. The, the, the economy has contracted about 35 percent. It's heading to 50 and a potentially uh, economic failed state. And the reason is Russia has cut off Ukraine's agriculture exports, which the economy is dependent on. The second thing, if we've been witnessing this for weeks now, Shannon, is that Russia has gained military momentum. They're using their artillery, which they have more of, and it outguns the Ukrainians in terms of range. And they've ground down the Ukrainians slowly, methodically, and they have gained more territory, particularly in the eastern Donbass region. But they've suffered significant casualties. Uh, Shannon, the Russian military, Ukraine's casualties have gone up as well. Mm -hmm. So what, what we think is going to happen here, Russia, before they continue the attack in the Donbass region to the west and conduct other operations, they're going to have to rearm and refit. This General, presents quickly, an opportunity to present. Yeah, uh, quickly, I was going to ask you about Snake Island. What do you make of the Russians giving that up, saying it's a goodwill gesture? The Ukrainians said they have just dug in and fight, uh, fought to keep it. It, listen, it, it, giving up territory and particularly something as symbolic as Snake Island, certainly that matters. Uh, I don't think the Ukrainians are going to occupy this uh, very quickly because they got their hands full doing other things. Russia is still going to be able to block mm -hmm. the, uh, the cargo ships from coming into the port of Odessa. They're still going to shut down Ukraine's economy. Uh, so, yes, it, it's important, but it's, it's not... It, incredibly maybe. consequential would yeah, be the best way to express it. What I was trying to say before is that what is, is happening here, Ukraine will have an opportunity here in several weeks to be able to conduct consequential counterattacks. But it's going to be completely dependent, in my judgment, on what has happened at these two meetings that you referenced, mm -hmm. the G7 and also NATO. We don't know for sure because the, what, what's, what's in the reports that have come out, uh, they're so general, yeah, we don't know the what the picture. level of commitment is going to be to provide the arms and munitions. And we know there's problems there. Some of the countries are not all in. France and Germany, not all in. Some other ones are not. The United States is, the UK is, and others are. Zelensky and his military will not be able to succeed unless they get those munitions. Yeah, and they, they have to get them in the right quantity, and they have to get them timely. That's they what I'm saying it about it's a tipping point. Yeah. General, thank you. We always appreciate your insights. Okay, good talking to Shannon. You too. Up next, parents fighting for justice after their children die from fentanyl overdoses. Plus, we're going to talk with Senator Rob Portman about what the government should be doing.
Oh. I was just going to add one last thing. You know, I've covered Biden for a long time. I would not have pegged him for the guy who, you know, would have been the vice president to the first black president, who would have had a, a black vice president and would have named a black woman to the Supreme Court. Um, so, you know, there are always surprises in the world of politics. Audie, thanks very much for joining us. I think this is your first time here in the Situation Room. First of many times to come down the road. Welcome to our team. Thanks very much, Audie, and thanks, David Chalian, of course, as usual. Uh, coming up, a really critical moment in the January 6th investigation. Former Trump White House counsel Pat Cipollone subpoenaed by the Select Committee. What will he reveal to investigators? Stand by. Why is Roger happy? Vera.org slash Medical Minute. Phil has one more check of the evening forecast next. Keep up with all the current news on your... While the restless hot night... Automotive has moved to the Empire Mall for the first great sale of the summer. Car shopping at the mall. That's right, with over 1,300 vehicles in the Sears Wing parking lot for a limited time. And a billion Toyota. Get 2.99% APR for 60 months with approved credit on certified pre-owned Toyota Corolla, Camry, and RAV4. Backed by a 7-year, 100,000-mile limited powertrain warranty. System attacks your joint and you need a career, you need something to fall back on, go to law school. My father said, nah, do what you like to do because that's what you'll do best. So I, <laughs> so I went to the CIA and I went to law school at night. And later on, under Jimmy, when Jimmy Carter won the election and appointed someone I didn't think was a, a good director, uh, I left. But having gone to CIA through a series of remarkable coincidences, uh, I, was brought, I was brought in, I, they, they elevated me to the legislative office to help work on all these investigations of the C. This Trump-backed conservative majority no longer needs even the center-right influence of Bush appointee John Roberts. It is moving forward, stripping away, as mentioned today, the EPA's energy powers. It departed from its claimed originalism to change and further expand gun rights this term amidst even this shooting epidemic. It rolled back an over 100-year civil rights law that offered, to be clear, relatively minor protections to defendants against police misconduct. It departed from a current balance that has existed in the law on religious freedom to grant more public prayer support to public school employees who, while paid by you, want to pray in front of everybody else. And it overturned, of course, Roe, the right to privacy, liberty, and abortion choices for women and others who can become pregnant. On Roe, it's the first time ever that the court has individually rescinded a human right. And researchers who track this actually estimate this court is now more conservative than fully 75% of Americans when you compare what it's doing to what people believe. Howard Dean just said that this has become an illegitimate court and it's not just about Roe, although on that important issue and more, we will be joined by Planned Parenthood President Cecile Richards, a veteran of that organization and very knowledgeable on these issues, and we're back in one minute. And I feel that the balance of nature has helped me out in... United States of America. I'm civil disobedience. Digital reporter Jacob Newton has that story on our website right now. Meanwhile, a grassroots health care organization wants to put the abortion issue on the ballot in South Dakota. Dakotans for Health has developed a language for a potential constitutional ballot measure, which if passed by state voters would make South Dakota's near total ban on abortion less restrictive. State law currently bans abortions except to save the life of the mother. The third thing tonight, a new report says houses and apartments in Sioux Falls are going up at the fifth fastest rate in the nation. The Inspection Support Network released the report based on 2021 building permits, which broke records in Sioux Falls. But this year is already on track to shatter last year's growth, with more housing units than ever before now underway in the city. You look at multifamily, we've already permitted as many units as of the end of May as we did all of last year. Right now, because of the shortage and the, the need and the ability to throw up a lot of units all at once through multi-housing is much simpler and quicker. Um, that's why you see those types of apartments going up in that at this point. 
Where all of the demand for housing is coming from and what kind of housing is the toughest to find tonight in your Money Matters at 10. Well, camp goers to Swan Lake Christian Camp will find some new additions on the grounds this summer. Two new cabins are just about complete. This will allow space for an additional 20 kids. Those who run the camp say they are seeing an increase in the number of campers. In tonight's Eye on Kelland, we'll look at the growth at Swan Lake Christian Camp and what the future holds. And finally, the fifth thing is the top play of the month of June. Harrisburg's Reese Janza is able to chip in from 30 yards out to earn the birdie. That shot helped her lead an individual state championship in early June. You can see the rest of the top plays from June by visiting this story on Kelloland.com. And now let's get one last check of our weather with Jay. And we do have a band of clouds passing through Sioux Falls right now. Nothing coming out of those clouds are just kind of cutting off our sunshine. Still a very pleasant evening with light winds and no humidity in the air. For tomorrow, we'll be about what we are right now temperature-wise. Highs will be in the mid-80s, partly the mostly sunny skies here in eastern Carolina. Thunderstorms possible out to the west. Thanks for joining us. Have a great evening. weekend, the travel nightmare as nearly 48 million Americans are expected to hit the road and skies for July 4th. Delays and cancellations. Travelers brace for turbulence. I'm giving both flights 50-50 odds right now. That's why a record number of Americans are driving instead, just as there's some relief at the pump. You would rather take a 10-hour drive than fly with your kids. Yep, most definitely. The July 4th forecast, the latest on the storm system that could bring rain, thunderstorms, and possible flash flooding. News out of the Supreme Court, the big ruling that could hurt the effort to fight climate change, and the latest immigration case, as history is made with the swearing-in of Justice Katanji Brown-Jackson. Abortion bans put on hold. The latest tonight as the battle over the procedure goes to the states. Plus, what President Biden wants to do to make abortion rights federal law. Our exclusive interview with the German Chancellor. What he told Margaret Brennan about Vladimir Putin and the war in Ukraine. Crime without punishment. Our CBS News investigation continues as we talk to frustrated moms who were told to solve their children's murders. And a sweet story involving an airline pilot and the tooth fairy. It'll be sure to make you smile. This is the CBS News with Nora O'Donnell. Reporting from the nation's capital. Good evening and thank you for joining us on this Thursday night, where it appears America is ready to travel and celebrate Independence Day. But there won't be freedom from the frustration and chaos that's already piling up. Tonight we can report that more than 440 flights were canceled and more than 3,200 delays just today. Flight demand is returning to near pre-pandemic levels and so have the travel nightmares with airlines struggling with pilot and other staffing shortages. Airlines, you could say, are really facing a test on the eve of what's going to be one of the busiest travel days. And if you want a sign of how it might go, the CEO of Delta Airlines is apologizing to customers. The situation so dire, the company is taking employees with office jobs and sending them to the ticket counter to check bags. CBS's Errol Barnett is going to start us off tonight from a busy Reagan National Airport. Good evening, Errol. Hey there, Nora. Good evening. Cancellations are stacking up across the country and the first black woman ever on the nation's highest court. But earlier today, a major blow to President Biden's agenda on climate change, a ruling that the EPA has limited authority to regulate emissions from power plants. The other ruling, allowing the Biden administration to scrap the Trump-era policy, forcing most asylum seekers to wait in Mexico while their cases are decided. The Supreme Court ending the term with those two consequential decisions, and they've already placed a major election case on their docket for the fall. ABC's senior national correspondent Terry Moran leads us off from the Supreme Court. At the Supreme Court today, a major blow to the Biden administration's efforts to fight climate change. 
In a 6-3 decision, the court's conservative justices voted to sharply cut back the EPA's ability to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from power plants. Chief Justice John Roberts, writing for the majority, at first acknowledged that capping carbon dioxide emissions may be a sensible solution to the crisis of the day. But Roberts declared that sweeping regulations like the one at issue in this case, aimed at reducing power plants' carbon output nationwide, go beyond the lawful authority of the EPA and must be approved by Congress first. A decision of such magnitude and consequence rests with Congress itself, Roberts wrote. The case was brought by West Virginia's attorney general representing a group of Republican-led states and coal and mining companies. Only a lot of people are going to try to make this into an issue about a climate change. This is about ensuring that Congress, not unelected bureaucrats, get to make the major decisions of the day. Justice Elena Kagan, in a scathing dissent joined by the court's two other liberals, insisted that the Clean Air Act, passed by Congress more than 50 years ago, gives the EPA flexibility to address climate change, and she blasted her conservative colleagues for taking it away. The court appoints itself, instead of Congress or the expert agency, the decision maker on climate policy, she wrote. I cannot think of many things more frightening. But on immigration, a victory for the Biden administration. In a 5-4 to four opinion, the justice has ruled that President Biden can end the so-called Remain in Mexico program, the Trump-era policy that forced roughly 70,000 asylum-seeking migrants to languish in Mexico as they waited for their cases to be resolved. Biden tried to end the program as soon as he took office, but a federal court reinstated it. Tonight, Chief Justice Roberts again writing the opinion, saying the lower court imposed a significant burden upon the executive's ability to conduct diplomatic relations with Mexico. In his dissent, Justice Samuel Alito accused the Biden administration of planning to simply release into this country untold numbers of aliens, adding, but the court looks the other way. And on this final day of a contentious Supreme Court term, a moment for the history books. After 233 years, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson sworn in as the first black woman Supreme Court justice in U.S. history. Her husband holding up two Bibles as Chief Justice Roberts delivered the oath. I am pleased to welcome Justice Jackson to the court and to our common calling. That history-making moment earlier today, Terry Moran, we were on the air when it happened. And, and Terry, well, the Justice Jackson brings a new perspective here, life experience and background to the court. The philosophical makeup, for the most part, remains the same. It does, Witt. It's still a 6-3 to three conservative supermajority. But they say that every new justice makes a new court. And Justice Jackson brings so much of that brilliant legal mind. Her history is a public defender representing some of the most despised Americans, really, and that legacy of black American women in this country, and already a major voting rights case on the docket for next year. It's a case that will test whether state legislatures can seize full control of election results just in time for the 2024 campaign. Wait. All right, Terry, thank you. And after a week of high-stakes meetings with allies overseas, President Biden also turning his focus to the Supreme Court, blasting the decision, overturning Roe v. Wade, accusing the justices of destabilizing America. Tonight, at least 12 states have ceased nearly all abortion services, but just today, courts in Florida and Kentucky temporarily halting significant new limits in those states. ABC's chief White House correspondent, Cecilia Vega, reporting from Madrid tonight. On the world stage for the last day of this high-stakes summit. Good afternoon, everyone. President Biden today turning his attention back home, blasting the Supreme Court and what he called its outrageous behavior. The historic ruling overturning Roe v. Wade now prompting a major shift for the president. He wants Congress to pass abortion rights protections at the federal level and says he now supports carving out an exception to Senate rules that would allow Democrats to do this with just a simple majority rather than 60 votes. I believe we have to codify Roe v. Wade in the law and the way to do that is to make sure the Congress votes to do that. But the president well aware that key members of his own party have said they're not on board with eliminating the filibuster, even when it comes to abortion rights. And just as the president was about to board Air Force One for the flight home, another blow to his domestic agenda, with that Supreme Court ruling limiting the EPA's ability to regulate greenhouse gases. 
the decision effectively making it impossible for his administration to reach its goal of cutting greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030 and eliminating carbon by 2050. The White House calling the decision devastating, saying it aims to take our country backwards. A whirlwind day for the president on this final leg of his trip. Cecilia Vega traveling with him, joining us now from Madrid. And Cecilia, at a press conference, President Biden was also pressed on those record high gas prices and was asked how much longer Americans should expect to be paying so much. Yeah, well, the president didn't give a date, but he basically told Americans to brace yourself. This is not going to end anytime soon. We have heard from this from him before. He is blaming Russia and this war in Ukraine for these sky high prices. And right now, he said that Americans should expect to feel the effects of this quote wit for as long as it takes. Cecilia, thank you. Tonight here crashed into the stationary vehicle. The driver and two migrants on board were taken to area hospitals in critical condition. This comes after 53 migrants died after being found earlier this week trapped inside a hot tractor trailer in San Antonio. Four people are now charged in connection with their deaths, including the driver of the truck, Homero Zamorano, a U.S. citizen who was in court today. Zamorano can be seen here at an immigration checkpoint in Laredo earlier this week. Authorities say he was hiding in the bushes, pretending to be one of the surviving migrants. Communities in Central America are grieving. In Honduras, Karen Caballero's two sons, 18-year-old Fernando and 23-year-old Alejandro, as well as her 24-year-old daughter-in-law, Margie Tamara, are among the dead. We all planned it as a family so they could have a different life and achieve goals and dreams. Also among the dead, 14-year-old Juan Tulul and his 13-year-old cousin, Pascual Guajiac from Guatemala. He had hoped to make enough money in the U.S. to buy his mother a house. Archbishop Gustavo Garcia Sierra has met with survivors in hospitals, most unable to talk. They're coming from situations of great injustice. They're fleeing. And so they are fleeing. And they have hope. While the memorial behind me continues to grow, the Archbishop will preside over a mass this evening to honor the victims. As for the suspected driver, if he is found guilty, he could face life in prison or the death penalty. Nora? Oh, Marvia Franca there. Thank you so much. President Biden is back at the White House tonight after a three-day NATO summit in Madrid. Before returning home, the president announced an additional $800 million in aid to Ukraine. Other NATO nations, including Europe's largest economy, Germany, said it would also provide additional weapons and further cut back on Russian gas imports. Face the Nation moderator and chief foreign affairs correspondent Margaret Brennan spoke exclusively with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz in Madrid. When you speak to Putin, does he acknowledge the sanctions? Does he acknowledge how much his economy has been hurt? Or does he just not care? I think he cares, but he will not really admit it. So you get some uh, Because it idea, hasn't stopped him. You get some idea that it really is hurting him and that he understands the deep impacts of our sanctions on his economy. And uh, I'm always mentioning it because it's necessary to say it. But this is now happening to a country that is not that advanced, that is really needing all the technologies from the rest of the world for having a similar standard of living and for having the chance to be part of a growth in the world economy. And this is now the real damage to the Russian economy. When will Putin run out of weapons, run out of funds, or can he, this continue for years? No one really knows. He has, uh, he is, he is uh, the hat, the leader of a very great country with uh, a lot of people living there, with uh, a lot of means, and he is really doing this brutal war with, uh, and, and he prepared for it very long. I think the decision to, to do this war was taken one year before it started or possibly earlier because he prepared for it and so he will be able to continue with the war really a long time. Germany is providing about two billion in aid to Ukraine. That's roughly what you spend per month on gas from Russia, on coal, on energy supplies. So while you're helping the Ukrainians financially, you're also essentially giving Vladimir Putin a financial lifeline. He cannot buy anything from the money he's, he's getting from us because he, will, he has all these sanctions on imports for modern technologies and things he is looking for. So this is what is making very angry. 
Well, Vladimir Putin can use that money elsewhere, uh, just not in the West. But so he cannot is, buy. Is it still two billion a month? that Germany is sending to Russia? It is always decreasing and I once again say that we decided that we do the san that we draft the sanctions in a way that they hurt Putin and this is what we do. And once again we are now doing real investments into technology in pipelines in ports mm -hmm. and I know there are people that sometimes think that when you are having taken a decision one afternoon, the next morning you have a port and a 40 kilometers pipeline, oh, it takes but time. in the real t life this is not happening. Well, you can see more of Margaret's interview with the German Chancellor on Sunday's Face the Nation. We want to turn now to our new investigative series, Crime Without Punishment, that looks at the rise of unsolved murders in the U.S. Tonight we go to Jackson, Mississippi, which has one of the highest per capita homicide rates in the country. CBS News Chief Investigative Correspondent Jim Axelrod reports on the impact these homicides have on family members and the troubling racial disparity in which cases get solved. Everyone in this room who has had a member of their family murdered, raise your hand. When we started calling mothers who'd lost their children to murder in Jackson, Mississippi, word got around and more than 30 people arrived for our interview. They didn't investigate my case. And more just kept coming. Margie Allen, Danita Williams, and Lucinda Wade Robinson all lost sons to gun violence in Jackson. Has there been any arrest made in either of these three cases? No. no. Uh -uh. Not one arrest? I was showed a picture of my baby on the side of the road. I was showed some information, and I was told to go solve my own crime. Go solve your own crime? And bring them the evidence, and I would take it to them. In Jackson, the capital of Mississippi, the numbers are stunning. 156 homicides last year, one of the highest per capita homicide rates in the entire country. The whole system is back long. Jackson Police Department Chief James Davis is talking about the state crime lab. I could use more police officers. I could use more homicide detectives. I don't think any police department in the nation can say that they got enough resources. The mothers repeatedly expressed frustration with the response they got from Jackson homicide detectives. I'll be honest with you, when your loved one is killed, you can never do enough to solve that case. And remember, this was your child, you want immediate answers too. The Jackson Police Department told us it makes arrests in six out of ten homicide cases, above the national average. I get the feeling no matter how often you talk about it, the tears don't stop. No, no. You just lay in bed no, at night I and do. just cry all night and you get up and try to mm -hmm. fight more to get justice for your child. Mm -hmm. It's too much. Three weeks after our visit to Jackson, police announced arrests in the case of Margie Allen's son's murder a year and a half after his death. Jim Axelrod, CBS News, Jackson, Mississippi. Well, our investigative series continues tomorrow with a report on how the Chicago police are using a loophole to inflate the number of murders they say they solved. And still ahead on tonight's CBS Evening News, an international manhunt ends in the arrest of a yoga teacher suspected of killing her boyfriend's lover. And a major COVID vaccine and treatment news, what you need to know. The perfect shot and more. Are southwestern South Dakota, but overall we're going to be avoiding any breezy conditions across the entire area for tomorrow. Future cast will show tonight the clouds kind of slowly clearing out. They're going to mainly stick around a long Air summer. I was thinking more like a time of day or maybe a day of the week. Yeah, no, you know what? You, you want to fly in the morning. I tell people to, you know, avoid afternoons because that's when the summer thunderstorms usually hit. Not always, but that's typically. And also the first flight out of the day, the first flight out has the least like likelihood of getting delayed or canceled because usually the crew is there, the plane is there. So try and get out in that first flight, even if you have to wake up at three o'clock in the morning. All right, John Jett, thank you. Hey, thank you. Omicron game plan, COVID booster shots being adjusted to fight the contagious variant, and now the FDA is offering new guidance to vaccine makers. We'll tell you what they're saying next. Plus, a big move that could change the Big Ten landscape, how far the conference's footprint could be expanding. This is News Nation. 
be formulated to reduce dryness. Titanium Max, the all new micro precision trimmer that goes where. Today's the day to announce the newest big money winner at Publishers Clearing House. To upper 80s tomorrow and this weekend, chances for showers and thunderstorms linger for you over the weekend and through the 4th. The nasty heat comes back for the beginning of next week. Stick around, Dakota News Now. We'll be right back after the break. The I-Team digs deeper into local and national news that impacts your life. The I-Team, only on Dakota News Now. Staying with us here, Greg Bias. He's from the FAA Command Center in Warrenton, Virginia. We've been talking about air traffic control and safety when it comes to the weather. We've got the big holiday weekend ahead of us. Um, Greg, I wanted to ask you, earlier we talked about the Northeast and some of the constraints and concerns that we have with severe weather in, on Saturday in particular. You mentioned that you issue ground stops and ground delay programs. Can you help explain what those are and help, how they help improve traffic flow? So a ground stop is uh, one of our measures or programs that we use to help manage the flow of traffic. And ground stops tend to be uh, for short duration, uh, typically an hour or less. And it's for uh, some immediate issue or some immediate occurrence at the airport. So it could be uh, an emergency. It could be a thunderstorm passing overhead. Uh, it could be uh, in any other issue that would impact operations. So while that airport is impacted, they're unable to take arrivals. So we don't want to add additional aircraft into the air uh, and have them come to a place uh, where they might have to go into holding, might have to divert to a different airport. Uh, so we implement a ground stop. So as an example, uh, we'll say a ground stop for JFK. Uh, they have a, a runway accident, uh, an aircraft runs off the runway. And so for a short period of time, uh, they're going to have to recover that airport and nobody's going to be able to land. So in order to manage that safely, uh, we put out a ground stop for JFK, but it's actually impacting the other airports that have departures that are scheduled to arrive at JFK. Uh, and that allows us to manage the flow, make sure we don't get too many aircraft airborne. We're able to recover the aircraft that are airborne uh, once the condition is cleared at the airport, and then we're able to release the ground stop and get things back to normal. So ground stop is... Hi, I hated sticking my fingers. Maybe there's somewhere somewhere in the 20, the mid 20s or high 20s range. Uh, that is concerning. Uh, I probably would not have done it the way the president did it overseas. I think all politicians should refrain. U.S. politicians should refrain from attacking or addressing political U domestic issues like this when they're overseas. But I, but I got to tell you, the court, as I, as I listened and read this decision today about the EPA, it, it 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 struck me in some ways. I was I was curious if the court actually honestly believed that the EPA exceeded their authority or they disagreed with the position of the EPA. And I'm, I'm not here to say I think the EPA may have, I don't necessarily fully know what the EPA has done in this situation, but I, I don't quite understand the decision uh, in some ways. And it, it leads me to believe if you look at the last two weeks of the court, They've done more legislating than the Congress has done uh, in the last two years. If I were progressives, and I'm not a progressive, progressives should be more focused on identifying uh, solutions and paths forward and not criticizing the president. Uh, that doesn't do anyone any good, and it certainly doesn't lead us to better answers and outcomes around choice for women and guns in New York where I live. Well, let's talk about that EPA decision. I want to play something from former EPA Director Administrator uh, Carol Browner, then we'll dig in. It's devastating. I, you know, it is yet another example of the court's unwillingness to protect the health and safety of the American people. It's tied EPA's hands behind its back. It's limited its ability to do what is smart in terms of addressing climate change. And Matthew, there are plenty of people on the other side in U.S. industry who are celebrating this check on administrative power in the administrative state in the U.S. What do you make of it? 
Well, the EPA's job is to do what it wants to do. It's to do what Congress tells it to do. And that's precisely the problem, Shannon. For decades now, Congress has delegated authority to these unelected and unaccountable agencies, and they've used it to fob off responsibility for their own political decision making. What the Supreme Court has done in recent weeks is say to the elected branches of government, you have to decide, you write the laws, not the courts and not the bureaucracies. And I think that's a good thing. Well, in a win for the Biden administration day, Kimberly and the other big case, uh, the remain in Mexico, get a little bit of reaction to that um, from folks who are seeing this and living it firsthand down at the border. Very disappointed in the decision today. This is devastating for the state of Texas and the United States of America. If we don't get help, we're going to continue to see this chaos. There's going to be more deaths and we're going to continue to see more people getting away. That's the problem that we're facing now. And we were hoping that the Supreme Court was going to give us a ruling that was going to allow us to get this under control. And unfortunately, they didn't. So, Kimberly, the real world impact of this is going to make things much tougher on Border Patrol and those down at the border. But as a friend of mine noted today, this also means the border is fully owned by the Biden administration because of this decision. Yeah, you can definitely understand the frustrations of those down at the border, but I, I have a harder time laying all of this on the, the feet of the Supreme Court. This was a very messy decision because there are a lot of statutes in play here. And one of the things that fundamentally came out, if you read the totality of the opinions and concurrences and dissent, is that this is fundamentally a function of the fact that Congress will not sit down and actually come up with a real immigration policy, one that an or or give the resources necessary to those agencies down at the border to actually do the job that they need to do. Um, and so we keep kicking this uh, to, to future administrations and asking the court to wade in. But fundamentally, we are going to have to address the root cause, which is a broken legislative system. Well, and much. Everybody watching in the war room, we're here today. I don't want anybody to take their eye off the ball of what we do every day. I want you guys to stay focused, stay on message. Remember, signal, not noise. This is all noise, that's signal. Thank you very much. Signal, not noise. And it was a January 6th co-plotter, Peter Navarro, who discussed his efforts with Bannon on behalf of Trump in public, but followed Bannon's cue there, the same move, just defy the investigators outright, despite a subpoena, he is now also facing a trial. I was on my way to Nashville today. What did they do? They didn't call me. Instead of calling me and saying, hey, we need you down at court. We've got a warrant for you. I would have gladly come. What did they do? They intercepted me getting on the plane. And then they put me in handcuffs. They bring me here. They put me in leg irons. They stick me in a cell. That's punitive. That, that what they did to me today violated the Constitution. And then Trump aide Michael Flynn, convicted, pardoned, but back in the sauce as he now claims the Fifth Amendment. I assert my Fifth Amendment right against uh, being compelled to be a witness against myself. It had been realized. Yeah. Is that statement in this memo true? General Flynn, do you believe in the peaceful transition of power in the United States of America? That's fair. And here's what Donald Trump says about taking the fifth. You see, the mob takes the fifth. If you're innocent, why are you taking the Fifth Amendment? The readout with Joy Reid is up next. We got the well, Republican, or excuse me, Democratic Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, she was tweeting in reaction to the EPA decision as it was um, breaking on Twitter this morning. She said this, catastrophic. A filibuster carve-out is not enough. We need to do reform or do away with the whole thing for the sake of the planet. Now, I wasn't sure if she first met the Supreme Court. I think, though, Matthew, she's referring to the filibuster there. Well, you never know with uh, AOC, do you, right? Um, and she, I'm sure she'd be open to packing the court or any of these major structural changes changes to government that progressives want because they can't achieve their aims through legislation. And that's the real problem for the left right now. They need to face the voters. And when you voters actually see what the left wants to achieve, more often than not, especially on social and cultural or green issues, voters blanch. 
Harold, uh, I want to ask you about something that the Wall Street Journal cautioned about, kind of cautioning Democrats saying, um, listen, a change to the filibuster rules is going to open the doors to Republicans for things that they may want to pass. We saw this when uh, then Senator Harry Reid changed the rules on judges, and we saw that where that's led us. Um, do you think there should be caution for Democrats against blowing up the filibuster at this point? I've never been one that's been a big believer in changing the filibuster rules. I understand the impulse on the part of a lot of Democrats, but I think what you take that energy, you channel that energy uh, at, the, at the ballot box. I think Republicans who believe last week that a sweep of the House and the Senate was something that was uh, a certainty or foregone, uh, I think they should, re, they should relook at this and perhaps a reset will be needed because I think a majority of the country is against what a lot of the things the court has done over the last two weeks, and we'll see how it plays out. But I'm against changing the filibuster rule for these things. Well, and even more importantly, two current members of the Senate, as we talked about, uh, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, are against it. They will stand as a block, and we'll see if anything changes as we look at the makeup of the Congress uh, after the midterms in just a mere weeks from now. Panel, thank you very much. The crossing in Missouri where this week's crash took place was already identified by the state as needing improvements. The cost estimated at $400,000. Maybe that the price of fixing this was the cost of lives. You know, and you can't, you can't put a dollar amount on that. That's, that's what's sad. Mike Spencer says he hopes this crash leads to nationwide change. Certain the outcome here could have been much different. I just wish it hadn't come to this. Pete Muntean, CNN, Menden, Missouri. And to our viewers, thanks very much for watching. I'm Wolf Blitzer in the Situation Room. You can always follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Wolf Blitzer. Tweet the show at CNN Sit Room. This programming note, join CNN for coast to coast fireworks and incredible music from some of the biggest stars. Celebrate the 4th in America. That's live July 4th, 7 p.m. Eastern, only here on CNN. Aaron Burnett out front starts right now. Summer to July 3rd on BillionAuto.com. Catch Dakota News Now at 9 on Fox Sioux Falls. It's news when you want it. Tonight on a historic day for the Supreme Court, the justice is revealing crucial rulings on the environment and immigration. In a setback for the Biden administration, the court setting new limits on the EPA's authority, but a victory for the White House on immigration, allowing the president to end the Trump era remain in Mexico policy, all as Ketanji Brown Jackson becomes the first black woman on the Supreme Court. And the president's stark criticism of the court over abortion with the new call for action in Congress as a Florida judge temporarily blocks an abortion restriction law. We're tracking hundreds of new flight cancellations into the holiday weekend. Delta pilots demonstrating how you can avoid travel chaos and the president's answer when asked how long soaring gas prices will last. The intriguing new discovery of a never served arrest warrant in the case of Emmett Till, the teenager whose brutal murder almost 70 years ago galvanized the civil rights movement. The fleecing of America, the family run ministry and the millions in assistance they got for employees who didn't exist. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening. The U.S. Supreme Court tonight ending a term that reshaped the court itself and the country in dramatic fashion. The first black woman to be confirmed as a Supreme Court justice sworn in today. Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson replacing retiring Justice Stephen Breyer. She joins a court that just days ago rocked the country with its ruling overturning the long established constitutional right to abortions. The term ending today with split decisions for the Biden administration administration on immigration and the environment. In a win for its border policy, the court saying the administration acted properly in trying to end the Trump era policy that requires asylum seekers wait in Mexico while their cases are decided. But the court also undercut the administration's climate change efforts, saying the EPA overreached in its efforts to move the country from coal production to cleaner alternatives. Justice correspondent Pete Williams has details. In one of the most important environmental rulings in decades, the court said the EPA does not have broad authority to limit greenhouse gas emissions 
by shifting energy production away from coal burning plants and toward cleaner sources like wind and solar. By a six to three vote, the court said such a major action would require explicit permission from Congress. Writing for the majority, Chief Justice John Roberts said, it is not plausible that Congress gave EPA the authority to adopt on its own such a regulatory scheme. It has really cut off the agency's ability to do the farthest reaching, most impactful thing, to cut carbon emissions from the power sector. That's the sector of the economy that produces about a quarter of our greenhouse gas emissions. For the dissenters, Justice Elena Kagan said the decision means the court appoints itself the decision maker on climate policy. I cannot think of many things more frightening. The court's ruling also could have broader implications because it said only Congress, not federal agencies, can set the rules on what it called major questions. Some legal experts say that's a recipe for inaction. Congress doesn't have the time or the expertise to be able to address all of the major social and economic problems on its agenda. And in addition, it's often incapable of reaching grand bargains. In a separate case, the Biden administration can go ahead with its efforts to end the Trump program that forces migrants seeking asylum to wait in Mexico. The vote five to four with Roberts and Justice Brett Kavanaugh joining the court's three liberals. Today also marked the end of Justice Stephen Breyer's 28 years on the court. His last official act was to join Roberts in administering the required two oaths of office to Katanji Brown Jackson, who becomes the court's first black woman. So help me God. Now on behalf of all of the members of the court, I am pleased to welcome Justice Jackson to the court and to our common calling. And Pete, looking ahead, the court said it will hear a case that could affect the coming presidential election. Yes, Lester, the court agreed to decide whether state legislatures and not state courts get the last word on how elections should be conducted for federal candidates. Republicans say that's how it's supposed to work, but opponents say that would leave state courts unable to defend voters when their rights are threatened, Lester. Pete Williams outside the Supreme Court for us tonight. Thank you. And this evening, President Biden slamming the Supreme Court for its decision overturning Roe v. Wade, accusing the justices of outrageous behavior and urging a controversial change to Senate rules in response. Kelly O'Donnell has that story. From a world stage moment in Spain, President Biden accused the highest court of upending American freedoms. The one thing that has been destabilizing is the outrageous behavior of the Supreme Court of the United States on overruling not only Roe v. Wade, but essentially challenging the right to privacy. Consequences he sees as so dire, the president urged Congress to restore abortion rights with new law. But in a 50-50 Senate, Democrats don't have enough votes, making a surprise announcement today. And if the filibuster gets in the way, the president said he would back a limited change to Senate rules to allow a simple majority vote to make abortion legal again nationally. Require an exception to the filibuster for this action to deal with the Supreme Court decision. That's a flip, breaking his decades-long filibuster support. Ending the filibuster is a very dangerous thing to do. But tonight, top Democrats say they cannot make the change because a few Democrats won't agree. While top Republican Mitch McConnell said the president's attacks on the court are unmerited and dangerous. Today, I asked about the political pressure he faces. Are you the best messenger to carry this forward? when Democrats, many of them, many progressives, want you to do more. <laughs> yeah, I am. I'm the president of the United States of America. That makes me the best messenger. Tomorrow, the president will meet with Democratic governors on abortion rights at the state level and will announce his own next steps. Lester? Kelly O'Donnell, thank you. In state houses and courthouses across the country, people are grappling with rapidly changing laws governing abortion. And Ann Thompson has the latest now on the next wave of restrictions that could be on the horizon. Moves on the state level to restrict abortions hitting legal obstacles. Florida's ban on abortions after 15 weeks scheduled to take effect tomorrow blocked in court today. That it violates the privacy provision of the Florida Constitution. Disappointing the governor. Yeah, these are unborn babies that have heartbeat. Kentucky's trigger law, a near total ban, put on a temporary hold too, applauded by that state's governor. 
the trigger law in Kentucky is extremist. Now a new salvo in the abortion rights war. Conservative lawmakers looking at potential laws to keep women from crossing state lines for legal abortions by targeting corporations paying their travel expenses. Arkansas State Senator Jason Rapert leads the National Association of Christian Lawmakers. We are, are, are exploring legislation and drafting language that would stop some of these woke corporations from using shareholder money illegally and without real authority to traffic people for the cause of an abortion. Some say any effort to stop women from crossing state lines is a step too far. This would be like Virginia passing a law saying that it's illegal for me to go to Maryland to get dental care or illegal for me to have my primary care physician be in the District of Columbia. Today, 90 local prosecutors from across the country have signed on to a statement refusing to prosecute those who seek, provide, or support abortions, calling criminalizing abortion care a mockery of justice. St. Louis County District Attorney Wesley Bell. But if your state bans abortion, isn't it your job to enforce the law? Well, it's well settled law that prosecutors have discretion over the limited criminal justice resources that we have. And we make decisions all the time. And, and that guiding principle is public safety and justice. A nation still debating what's enforceable and what's law in a post row world. Ann Thompson, NBC News. All right, let's circle back now to the court's ruling allowing President Biden to end the remain in Mexico policy at the border. It has migrant advocates celebrating, but critics say it will send the record number of border crossings soaring even higher. Gabe Gutierrez now with late details. My pleasure, John. And let's look deeper now at the climate change ruling. Many environmental advocates acknowledge today the decision is the EPA, in the EPA case is a significant blow in the government's efforts to limit greenhouse gases in the near term. As we said, West Virginia won the case after a legal battle over the clean power plan. First, let's hear from the Biden administration. Michael Regan is the EPA administrator. He joins me now from New Orleans. Administrator Regan, thank you very much for joining us. President Biden today said this decision is devastating. How much of a setback is it for your efforts to regulate greenhouse gases? Well, well, thank you for having me. And listen, I am deeply disappointed in the Supreme Court's decision today, actually very frustrated. Uh, the decision does constrain what we do, but let me be clear, it doesn't take us out of the game. Uh, we still will be able to regulate uh, climate pollution, and we're going to use all of the tools in our toolbox to do so. The constraint that we're seeing today just prevents us as a country from making the progress as quickly as we need to. Climate action presents an opportunity for this country to ensure global competitiveness, create jobs, lower costs for families, and protect people's health and well-being, especially those who have suffered uh, from the burden of inaction for far too long. And so, yes, today's action is a disappointing uh, action. It's, uh, it's devastating in many ways, as the president has said, but it doesn't take us out of the game. And we're going to continue to use every tool we have uh, to keep pace with tackling the climate crisis. Well, the analysts, the experts that we are talking to, Administrator Regan, are saying, yes, it does give you some options, but every option out there from now on is both more cumbersome and more expensive for the government. Uh, so from that standpoint, how much of a setback is this? Well, you know, we, we pride ourselves in keeping pace with the growing economy and technological advancements. And so this does constrain the innovation that we could uh, see from the power sector itself. The, the constraints are on how we can provide the rules of the road for long-term investments by the power sector. But let's be clear, uh, the Supreme Court has also constrained what the, the power sector would like to do in terms of long-term investments and the utilization of technologies and programs that could be more expansive and more flexible for the industry itself. And so it, it is a setback. And we will continue to evaluate very thoroughly uh, what the Supreme Court actually has said today. Uh, but let's be clear, the constraint does not take EPA out of the game. And we're going to continue to use every tool in our toolbox because it's under our legal authority and it's our obligation to protect communities, reduce pollution that is driving climate change, 
and provide certainty and transparency for the energy sector to grow the clean energy economy. Well, can you give us a couple of examples of the kind of tools that you believe you still can use to regulate this industry? Well, you know, one tool that we'll continue to look at is the authority that was um, in question with the Supreme Court. Uh, again, that tool is still available. Uh, we've just lost some flexibility there. Uh, but we also have a, a suite of regulations that are facing uh, the, the, the power sector. And so as we couple the regulation of climate pollution with the regulation of health-based pollution, uh, we are providing the power sector with a very clear picture of what regulations they're facing so that they can might make the right investment decisions. And we're hoping that when they look at the regulation of waste uh, and, and discharges in water, uh, climate pollution, health-based pollution, they'll see that it's not worth investing in the past. And they'll continue to do what they're doing now, which is invest in the future. And that future is a clean energy economy. Let me ask you also about just the course of, of what the court has ruled. Now that you are looking at a majority conservative court, how much does that concern you in terms of steps the EPA may take in the future that are most likely to be challenged uh, either by state, uh, by the states, by state attorneys general, or others who oppose these efforts by the government uh, to impose some regulation? You know, it really uh, forces us to uh, contemplate how we move forward uh, as quickly as possible, recognizing that some flexibilities have been taken from us. And so it does impede the progress, uh, but it does not prevent us from continuing to make progress. And so we'll have to be, you know, vigilant in terms of focusing on climate change pollution. We'll also have to continue to do what the president has asked us to do, which is partner with every single cabinet agency and leverage all of the actions as a whole of government. Uh, we've got some opportunities ahead of us. This is a setback, deeply disappointing, uh, frustrating to a certain extent. But again, we're going to use every tool in the toolbox that we have uh, to set and implement environmental standards that meet our obligation to protect all people and all communities from environmental harm. Um, Mr. Administrator, I'm about to talk with the Attorney General for the state of West Virginia, which was instrumental in bringing this case uh, to the Supreme Court. What would you say to him is something that you hope that he uh, and others who brought this case would be willing to look at as a way for the government to make sure that these plants are operating in the cleanest possible way? You know, I would say that the, the markets have already spoken. Uh, and when you look at the regulation that was in question, that never took place, that the Supreme Court evaluated, um, the, you know, the goals of that regulation were, were met and exceeded years and years ago. Uh, and so there's proof that the market is already moving in this direction, and it's our obligation as the government to be able to provide some certainty so that they can make longer-term investments. And so we'll continue to work hard to provide that certainty so that the power sector can continue to make long-term investments in a clean energy economy. Administrator Michael Regan of the EPA, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And as we said, 19 Republican-led states were a part of the legal challenge to the EPA. Let's turn now to the person I just mentioned. He is West Virginia's Attorney General Patrick Morrissey. He led the national coalition at the Supreme Court. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, I don't know if you were able to hear the EPA administrator, but I just want to ask you first, how much of a victory is this today for electric power generation for the power plants in this country? Look, I think it's a big victory for the rule of law. And I did have the chance to uh, listen to the administrator. And I guess what I would say back is a lot of people are saying tonight, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. But people have to take into account that the EPA never had this authority in the first place. There were big promises made over the last decade in terms of what type of initiatives the EPA was going to advance to fight climate change. But we always knew that the EPA only had a narrow sliver of authority to regulate carbon emissions. What I would say to Americans watching tonight is that this decision is not about climate change. It's really about a very simple proposition. 
who gets to make the major decisions of the day? Should it be unelected bureaucrats seizing power that has not been delegated to them, or should it be Congress? We've always argued that it's Congress because that way, whether you're New York or West Virginia or Texas or Nebraska or any of the states across the nation, you're going to have a seat at the table and you're going to have the people's representatives making a choice. And that's what this case is all about. And it's just disappointing to hear a lot of people try to characterize it in some other way. They never had the authority. We knew that from the beginning when we saw the case. I've been working on this since 2013. Uh, but it's critical now to understand that so that the debate will likely shift to Congress. But even more importantly, I think people will know now there's a broader tool in place to go after federal overreach whenever it emerges. Well, what we just heard from Administrator Regan and what we've heard from others is that the authority to regulate is still there. It's just that the amount of flexibility is different. So there, I mean, do you still, do you acknowledge that there are still steps that the government can take as necessary for, to make sure that the power plant industry, uh, the, the, the energy industry, industry broadly is being careful when it comes to protecting the environment? Well, most certainly there will be authorities that are available under the Clean Air Act, and uh, that won't change from today. So we've always argued that over the past number of years. In fact, we've argued that the EPA does have a narrow ability to regulate for carbon emissions. But I think folks watching need to understand what this administration has done is they're trying to change the fundamental mission of many of the federal agencies out there. If you're not only the EPA, but you're the HHS, or you're the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Department of Energy, the Department of Labor, the Biden administration is asking everyone to change their mission and become more of an environmental regulator. And that's just not the way our Constitution works. Agencies need to comport with the limits that Congress provides to them. And what we've seen with the Biden administration and others as well, of uh, that they have gone so far afield from that statutory authority. I think that's why the court reined them in today. And I think you're going to see more effort to ensure that the Biden administration respects the rule of law, our constitution, and the separation of powers. This is a big win for the people of America because now their elected representatives will have a clear voice. Two other quick points, uh, Mr. Attorney General. And Justice Kagan, in her dissenting opinion today, pointed out, she said Congress has told the EPA, she said, uh, to use the best system of regulation so that there was direction from the Congress and, and there was leeway. And there's now been clarification of how much leeway. But in other words, there's still uh, ad advisory from the Congress to the agency to do the best it can to, to make sure these emissions are as clean as possible. Well, look, I, I think no one is arguing. This is not about having efficiencies or uh, clean air. In fact, everyone supports it. Once again, this is not a case about climate change or hamstring a federal agency. It's about ensuring that when a federal agency acts, it's comporting to the limits that Congress prescribes for them. So the EPA still has certain tools to move forward. But what they don't have the ability to do is on these major questions of the day, for where there's vast economic or political significance, they can't proceed on the basis of maybe some ambiguous language and then try to rewrite the nation's power grid. They can't do that. That's what they tried to do under the Clean Power Plan. And obviously, they've talked about doing things that are not feasible today in terms of trying to have 100 million people on the power grid for electric cars and not only finishing to wipe out coal and get rid of half of natural gas, some of what they're trying to accomplish, they clearly don't have the legal authority to do. So what I would ask people to do, don't promise your constituents things you can't deliver. Work within the constitutional systems in order to deliver things that are good for the people. And I think that you'll find a lot of folks care deeply, like a lot of West Virginians, about clean air and clean water but we have to make sure we respect our constitutional system, and that's what today's case stands for. And I'm sorry, I'm not getting having time to pose to you the question that 
uh, the administrator recommended at the end, he said to mention the fact that he hopes you, re you and others realize the markets have already spoken. They want the power industry to move but in a clean Judy, direction. The markets responded because the government put a gun to their head and said the regulations are coming to wipe you out. So people forget about that. Government should never possess that kind of power to be abusive. That's why we fought back. The Attorney General for the state of West Virginia, uh, Mr. Morrissey, thank you very much for joining us. Nearly 486, that's about a nine cent dip from last week. Analysts say lower oil prices and the fear of a possible recession are helping to drop the cost of gas. And they say that trend may continue for at least the next few days. AAA predicts close to 48 million Americans will travel at least 50 miles from home between June 30th and the 4th of July. Phil's back with a look ahead to this evening's weather forecast right after this on KSFY. I feel that that's my calling to give. In order to protect abortion rights, but is that a dangerous move? Plus, we've been following the story of American Alex Drukey, captured in Ukraine. His mother was able to speak with him today, and she's our guest. On Doritos, only a dollar ninety-nine with coupon. Scan the QR. And now he's going to the Middle East. Why can he take these really, really long flights to other countries, but he can't visit the border? It's like a four and a half hour flight. Or why can't he go to a rig or a refinery in Louisiana? Why can't he do that? And why doesn't the White House send him? Just criminal charges. Just some of the media excitement around something that not only hasn't happened, nobody but those in the media have actually talked about, and that is criminal charges against President Trump out of the January 6th committee. Colby Hall is here, founding editor of Mediaite, the news, the nation's premier site for news about the news. Uh, Colby, at some point, does the cheerleading become a little too naked? I think it does. I mean... I'll be honest with you, not all of the enthusiasm is necessarily cheerleading. And, and you know this well from having worked in the newsroom. You know, people that, that are journalists or work in news are, are, are nerds, right? Like, they, we get excited when news happens. And I think sometimes, um, you know, you, you see that enthusiasm, that excitement. It's not necessarily cheerleading. That said, there is also a lot of cheerleading. And, and this is a story that, you know, a lot of cable news outlets have been focused on for the last five years, just assuming that there will eventually be criminal charges. You know, they want to see the former president in locked yeah. up. Never was going to happen. But, you know, the fact that some of these people cannot, you know, withhold well, they can't, they can't give up the ghost of is... Yeah, you can't give up the ghost of Russiagate, which you, you'd think at some point both the viewers and the host would, would learn that. But, hey, either way, you know, Al Michaels once said, I, I don't root for either team. I root for drama in the game. And there was so much drama on the hearing, this emergency hearing with Cassidy Hutchinson. Take a listen to some of the coverage there. Cassidy Hutchinson. 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 So few of the channels followed that up with dot, 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 three federal law enforcement officers say what she's saying, her most salacious things aren't true. I mean, she she was a star witness because she looked the part. She was telegenic. She was, uh, you know, sort of a young woman who had been very close to the center of the power structure in the Trump administration. So she was a, like a leading lady that we haven't quite seen. You know, there is still debate about, you know, what she said. Clearly, there were some uh, discrepancies between what she said that she had heard and what others are saying. I will say, however, that that was but one small part of you know, two or three hours of testimony that was all pretty right, but, but fair, fair, was, fair, was a game fair, changer. Okay, Colby, but fair to say that if, if the flip side had happened, right, if, if a member of the Trump organization had testified publicly that this didn't happen and there were rumors of uh, an incident like this and there was a couple of sources who said, oh, President Trump did whatever, when this happened thousands of times during the Trump administration, everybody ran with, oh, the Trumps are lying. Well, I, if you're arguing that there's a different standard being held to, you know, the Trump administration by the media, I, I'm not going to argue with that because I wouldn't win that argument. But I would also say that the Trump administration also applied its own different standards, meaning fair, he fair flouted enough. the basic decorum. 
Yeah. And and the media sort of took the bait, and we, you know we're all sort of in this mess. Yeah, now sort of made of our of, of everyone's making. There's yeah. blame to go around. Fair, all enough, the way fair, around. fair enough. Fair enough. always this argument you might win. I'll be interested in your your feelings on this. As you noted, President Trump sort of broke every norm in the book. It's one of the reasons the media hated him so much. And also loved him, by the way. They, they, right. They well, they loved they loved him because they needed him. Um, right. It,